Those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea say, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to save yourselves. We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So, I'm going to stop there for a minute. We'll, we'll continue on in the, the latter part when Jesus comes on the scene in a second. But John the Baptist, it says, was preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And if you have your Bible map, I know you don't have, probably don't have one. Or something, but it's to the to the west of the Dead Sea. If you have your map like that, I suppose we could have put it on the screen. But it's to the west of the Dead Sea, where the Jordan River comes into, um, basically about where the Jordan River attaches to the Dead Sea. And and if you to look on your, uh, you know, you could sort it out and look at it. Uh, it's north of Jerusalem. It's out in a wilderness area. And it's kind of where there wasn't a whole lot going on because it was a desert area. And so John the Baptist is out in the wilderness and he's, he is uh, preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He doesn't, he's not going into the big city, which is kind of what, he, what he's saying here. He's not going there. He's, he's in the desert and people are coming out to him to hear. And it says, he's saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the kingdom of heaven, we'll kind of look at that for a minute. What does he mean by that? Uh, John is the only one, I mean, sorry, Matthew is the only one who uses this expression, the kingdom of heaven. Most of, all of the other uh, gospel writers use the, wo the words kingdom of God when they're expressing kind of parallel passages. So we don't want to read too much into what kingdom of heaven means. And in, in look, reading up about this a little bit, I found out that the, the Jews that wrote, um, there were devout Jews and, and scribes and Pharisees that wrote about, uh, wrote stuff, <laughs> whatever it was. The scribes wouldn't use the word, word God or they wouldn't use the word Yahweh when they, when they, they said God. So they would, they would always substitute something because it was considered a really holy word. So um, they wouldn't, they would try to avoid using God's name, which was Jehovah or Yahweh or some that's that's the um, that's our interpretation of the word but uh, that is God's revealed name, revealed name or the word Elohim which is God uh, they would substitute words and one of the, some of the words they use would be one word meaning the name instead of uh, say, instead of saying God they would just say the name and then in Acts you actually have uh, that used the word space, the word for space, and heaven. So Matthew chooses the word heaven. So he talks about this kingdom of heaven, which is really just the kingdom of God. So in case we get too, you know, somebody gets too far down the road of saying there's a big difference, I don't really think there is. There is some difference in, in the inclusion, but we won't go into that right now. So basically he's saying the kingdom of God, the spirit, the, the rule of God, 
the place where God rules. And um, it's described as the fear, the sphere, <laughs> in which God's sovereignty is exercised. So where, the place where God is ruling. Now there's two parts to this. There's a spiritual rule that we, we allow God to be king in our lives or in the life of you know, hearts, the believers. He rules. We, we adore him as king. And there's also going to be a literal rule uh, as the Bible unfolds. We find that there's going to be a literal rule in which uh, Jesus is going to be reigning literally on the earth in his kingdom. So it's something that's always existed, the kingdom of God. His rule, his sovereignty, sovereignty meaning his, uh, his reach, his power over whatever that might be. So his sovereignty over the world, it's always existed, but, but, but in its fullness and its complete realization, that's going to be in the future. So, so Matthew is saying, I mean, John the Baptist is saying, the kingdom of God is at hand, or the kingdom of heaven is near. The inauguration, the beginning of that kingdom, so the one that had been, what he's saying is the one that had been prophesied, and, and uh, I think when we first talked about um, um, Matthew 2, and we were talking about the incarnation when Jesus came on, comes on the scene, and you find out that he's going to be a ruler. And, he's, uh, and you, you look at the different passages, for instance, in Micah, where it talks about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, it talks about him being a ruler on the earth also. The one about in Isaiah where it talks about him, a son that is born to us. It also says that he's going to be a ruler, okay? A prince of peace. And so when we look at when we look at these um, these passages that say, okay, this is the inauguration of the kingdom, the beginning of the kingdom, the full realization of that may not have happened at that moment. So when Jesus comes on the scene as a baby and he's called the king of the Jews like we looked at in the second chapter or the king of Israel it doesn't mean that even though he was coming on the scene that he was incarnated and he's and he's there and they say it's at hand and they say the kingdom is there it doesn't mean that that's that complete fulfillment of, of the prophecy is, is, is in place so we're following that so when we come to this place where John says the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's talking about the ruler of that king kingdom is here now, and he's coming to begin that, begin that time where he begins to do all that he's going to do and then set up his rulership. So <clears throat> can I make a brief comment right yeah. too? Mm -hmm. um, like if you wonder, well, what's the big deal? It just like we could skip over that really easily, but Matthew makes, like we're going to see him say king of heaven a ton throughout the book, so mm -hmm. it's it's worth considering, and it's developed throughout the book, but it's not just like some passing thing, it's important this kingdom of heaven is going to be repeated I think 30 fun times. Yeah, basically when we get to Matthew 5, Matthew 7, and even up right at the end of the book, the book we hear a lot about the kingdom of heaven. So yeah, that's, that's really the significance of that. So John begins to talk about that. And then uh, begins uh, the writer, Matthew, begins to talk about John himself and who John is. It says, For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now that, that, that prophecy in Isaiah chapter 40 is not just John the Baptist, but it is... But it, John the Baptist is a fulfillment of that. So he's the one that's preparing people to, to receive the Messiah. And it's, uh, so we have, we have that, that going on, okay? And so, where am I now? Oh yeah, voice of one crying in the wilderness, the, the prophecy. There's a prophecy that there's this person that's going to come along and prepare the way for God. And uh, for the Messiah. And it says, Now John himself was clothed in, in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Now, the significance of that, it's kind of lost on us. It's kind of like a detail. That, that seems like a, a pretty uh, crazy man. So I, I want us to uh, maybe 
see, maybe see the significance of it to the Jewish people at that time. So if somebody could read, look up this verse. It's 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse, verses 7 and 8. Okay? 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse 7 and 8. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was an and hair, and this is King James, a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. So Elijah had come on the scene. He was prophesying, okay? And they said, what did he look like? And they basically said, he's a hairy man. He had a leather belt tied around his waist. And the king said, oh, that's Elijah. So there's kind of the sense of uh, John is kind of typifying Elijah and maybe identifying with Elijah in some way. That, that he is uh, a prophet. Because in, in Jerusalem at, uh, at this time, among the Jews in Israel, there hadn't been a prophet for hundreds of years. They haven't had, hadn't had somebody speak from God to the people for almost 400 years. Till John the Baptist comes along and says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So it's pretty, it's significant to the people that here's this guy out in the wilderness fulfilling the, the prophecy about the wilderness and he's dressed like Elijah, as is described in, 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 the, in the book of Kings. So you have, you have this, uh, this image of John the Baptist. And it says, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan, went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So he was getting popular. He was being very popular. He was, he was out there, and they were baptized. He was baptizing people, and they were confessing their sins and, and getting baptized and being, getting ready to meet the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 7, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, a little background on who these guys are. These are the religious leaders of the time. The... Uh, the Pharisees are, are a little different from the Sadducees. The Pharisees tried to live really virtuous lives. They had more of a supernatural belief to them. They didn't just do the right things, but they had a lot of traditions along with it. Um, they had a meticulous observance of, of things for, for, pure, for being pure, for tithing. They would tithe, you know, they got a little bit of grain. They would tithe the grain. They would tithe the spices, they would tithe anything a little bit to the to the temple. They were just like really really locked into keeping the law. And they had a lot of tradition that they had built up over a lot of years that went along with what the law was, which was the first five books of the Bible. Genesis through Deuteronomy. So they had an, an emphasis on their traditions too that were just as binding to them as law was. So they were just as important that not only what the Bible had said, but the traditions that had built up over the years about all those things were important to them. And they also believed in angels, and they also believed that if a person uh, lived a good life, there were rewards, and uh, there was eternal death if they didn't. And uh, they, they, did, they did what they did, believing in a resurrection. Okay? And there was the history tells us there's about 6,000 of them in uh, Jerusalem at this time. And uh, so they believed in the difference between them and the Sadducees. Or the Sadducees were, were also the leaders and a lot of the chief priests, the, the main guys, the political leaders, were Sadducees. But they didn't actually believe in angels or they did not believe in uh, the resurrection future resurrection. They figured once the body died, the soul died, and that was the difference in their belief. But they didn't believe uh, in the oral traditions either. They didn't believe in the, all the things that had been built up that the Pharisees followed to the letter. The Sadducees just believed in the first five books of the Bible. They said, that's the law, and that's all we need to keep. We don't have to do all that the Pharisees are telling us to do. So that was, these are the two types of people, and they're coming out. Okay, so they're coming out, and uh, you know, how I remember one of these things about the Sadducees is that 
they didn't believe in a resurrection, so they were sad, you see. <laughs> That's what somebody told me. <laughs> That's where it all started. <laughs> so anyway, so they yeah, come up, they're okay. coming out for the baptism. <laughs> If you know my family, we have a lot of that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. I was with my whole family this past weekend. Oh, no. <laughs> there was a bit of that going on. <laughs> You're, a funny, funny <laughs> 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 You're a funny crowd. You're a funny crowd. I thought she said, I think she's a funny crowd. So, uh, so let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so there, they are coming out to John's baptism, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> Because they're in Jerusalem mostly, they're 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 the leaders, they're the, they're the main guys, but they hear about John and all the people that are coming out to to get baptized by him, for for repentance, for getting rid of their sin, and they go, okay, well we could, we should do that. And John sees them and goes, I don't know you guys. He doesn't say it quite like that. He calls them a bunch of snakes. Okay, he <laughs> says you brood of vipers. You know who told you? Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, the context of that is these people believe that because they were, they were children of Abraham, because they were Jews who were, who were in the lineage of Abraham, that there was no possible way that they were going to uh, not be saved. There was no possible way that they were going to be judged for their sin because to, you know, that was only for people who didn't really have what they had. And so... John the Baptist comes along and says, you know, you're a brood of vipers, you're a bunch of snakes. And he says, are you really coming because you're afraid that your, your salvation is in danger? Because he's kind of calling them out because they're doing the popular thing and they're trying to look good and they're, maybe they're trying to do the right thing in some way, but they're not, their heart, he, could, he knows their heart isn't right. And that maybe they're just trying to feel okay with the way they are. And this baptism that, that they were doing was they were immersing people in the water. Now, in the Jewish system at the time, they would have baptisms or they would have cleansings, ceremonial cleansings, which involved different things, but they didn't involve g actually getting into water. And that type of baptism was generally reserved for people who wanted to become uh, followers of, of, of Judaism, basically. And they were con converting into the Jewish religion. And then they would get completely baptized because they were so dirty, they, they needed the full body, <laughs> you know, uh, bath, basically. They were rid it was symbolic of getting rid of sins. So when he sees these guys who are the religious leaders coming out to get baptized, he, he goes, do you guys really believe that you are, need to confess your sin? Because we need what needs to happen is you have to have the fruits of repentance. In verse 80 he says, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, have something in your life that indicates that there's been a change in your life and your heart and your attitude so that when you come out here to get baptized, you are really actually repenting and turning from sin. Because these people are repenting and turning from sin. And you just want to be included and go along with it. So he, he calls them out for that, you know, and um, he goes on to say in verse 9, and do, do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for as I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. In other words, you're not special. You are not, you are not okay just because of who you are and how you were born. He says, you have to come to Christ. You have to, you have to come and bow down and be, um, be repentant of your sin. And then he begins to talk about judgment, and he says, and he, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which is not very good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So he's saying, right now, the, the judgment is about to come. Just like somebody taking an axe, and he's got it right there against the tree, and he's ready to, to knock the tree down. He says, God is ready to judge. God is about to judge and bring someone on the scene that will make a difference 
so that you will have to choose. You will have to choose to follow after Christ. You will have to choose to be righteous in reality. Otherwise, you're going to be judged. And that's what uh, we don't. I don't want to take too much time to talk about being what it means to be thrown into the fire. But then talking about God's judgment. And so when when John sit, t- talks about the wrath to come. Who told you you should try to escape the wrath to come? He's talking about there's coming a time this person is not only going to save and redeem, but he's going to judge. So he goes on to say, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit so he's talking about I am uh, baptizing you in water that is for the repentance of sin for a ceremonial cleansing from your sin that's one thing but the one that's coming after me is going to give you a baptism in the Holy Spirit and fire now the baptism in the Holy Spirit is, is something that comes upon comes to believers as when they have the Holy Spirit given to them. Now at this point, what happened, you, as you read the scriptures, you know that there's, there's a difference in what was going on at this time in, in, uh, in Matthew's time or in Jesus' time before the church started in Acts chapter 2. And just for a second, I want to, just for clarity, I want to kind of go to Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 1. And because they mentioned John there, okay? Jesus mentions John himself. So go, let's go to Acts chapter 1. And this is after uh, Jesus uh, had risen from the dead. And he was uh, he was on the earth. He was getting ready to, to go back to heaven. And chap- verse 4 says, And being assembled together with them, he can- commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. Now, the, this promise of the Father that he had talked about in a, another place was the Holy Spirit, who was going to come and live with them and be in them and teach them things and lead them into truth and, and give them power to witness for him. So, and he said, you have heard me talk about that. I promised you that the Holy Spirit was coming. And then in verse 5, he says, for John truly baptized with water, talking about John the Baptist, okay? But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay, so remember we were talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and and the Bible teaches in the Old Testament in different prophecies that this ruler, Jesus, is going to rule the whole world. So the disciples' question is relevant. It's not like they're way out of line in asking the question because he's saying, is that the time when you are going to rule this earth? But Jesus says, he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. You see, he doesn't say, no, that's not going to happen like that. I'm not going to rule. He doesn't say that. He says, it's not the time, it's not for you to know the time when that's going to happen. So he's not saying there's no kingdom on earth or kingdom in Israel. He's just saying it's not right now. It's not going to happen. It's not for you to know when that's going to happen. Now we as Christians believe that that is going to happen in the future. And, um, you know, I've been talking a lot about this lately in the, in, uh, we're up in Canada. And uh, there's a lot to it. So we, we don't want to go too far into that right now. But just to know that they were looking for that kingdom to be established right then and there. And Jesus says, well, it's not going to happen now. But, he says, and verse 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So Jesus said, you're going to receive this power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and you're going to go and witness for me. So the idea there was that when the Holy Spirit was going to come, and in, and in 1 
1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, we have been baptized into one spirit. All of us have been baptized into the kingdom of, of, of Christ, into the church. So the idea there is that the spirit of God is going to come upon them and give them the power to, to talk, to live, to, to, to understand. Uh, there's a lot of elements to that. But it's God's Holy Spirit in them that was going to give them uh, the supernatural part of their, their experience. And the same is with us. When we come to Christ, we are born of the Spirit, the Bible teaches. And we begin to, we begin to have a supernatural understanding of things. That the Bible says that the natural man in his flesh doesn't receive. Now that's a whole other teaching, so I'm not going to go too far into that. But just for us to understand and that John the Baptist is saying, there's coming one after me that's going to do something far different than what I'm doing. So he's saying, the one that's coming after me is going to give you the Holy Spirit. And he's also going to be judging some of you. That's what the fire part is about. Because it says in verse 12, he begins to talk about 12. He says his winnowing fan is in his hand. Who knows what a winnowing fan is? Yeah. It's something that separates like wheat from like other stuff that's not wheat. Right. Gold <laughs> <laughs> star for John. That's the technical answer. <laughs> <laughs> the science. <laughs> it was it was a, a fan or wood winnowing fork sometimes. It's just something that would do what Josh said. The wind would would would, uh, would blow away the, the outer part of the shell of the of the wheat, so they throw it up in the air and it was kind of like what they call chaff, like flour, or not flour, but kind of just waste product, the outside shell of the wheat, and that would blow away. And so the illusion here, uh, here is to, uh, he was thoroughly clean, his winnowing fan is in his hand. So he's go God is going to separate the righteous from the ones that don't really have that intrinsic value like the, the wheat does, okay? So he's going to separate, just like a, a, a farmer or, or, or separates wheat. He says, his winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean him out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, the wheat being the believers, okay? But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now John, John lays it out there in judgment. He talks about judgment. He says there's going to be a judgment for those who do not accept and follow after Jesus. There's going to be judgment going on. And said, so he's saying, the one who's coming after me, not only will he give you the Holy Spirit, but he's also going to bring judgment eventually to the earth. So right there, let's stop for a second. Is there any questions about what we talked about so far? are you in? New King James. Okay. So it, it just okay. says fan in because I'm in the King James version. Oh fan, yeah. I'm in mine says fan. So it doesn't add winnowing? So you just uh, know what that is or it says winnowing in this <laughs> Okay, sorry. Just a technical know. question. Is, mine doesn't say winnow mine ESB just says say? fan, so it was confusing at first. Okay. What does the ESV say? It says or winnowing for winnowing for I assume it's one it's just Greek one. word that yeah. It's just one thing. It just meant that. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, yeah, just uh, so so the baptism that John was administering to people. Do you see it just kind of like a for a, a, a or Christ baptism is a type of. It, there's similarities to it, like John's baptism. Just maybe a little bit of clarification. Yeah, what was John wanting to actually, accomplish, and yeah. what was kind of I was yeah I was just kind of getting to, to that about the baptism. Um, let's go to Acts chapter nineteen because this this kind of uh, this kind of helps us. What happens in Acts chapter nineteen is that the Holy Spirit has been given once in Jerusalem, and in Acts chapter ten, it's been given to a place in Caesarea. And there's been supernatural things happening to show that the Holy Spirit was given to those people. And so this, this time they go up into, into Greece, into Ephesus. 
and they find these people that believe in, in God, they believe in Jesus, okay? So they go, uh, Paul and everybody else, Paul and his uh, partners go up to, to Ephesus, and they find these people, people, well, let's just read it, and then I'll Acts chapter 19, it says, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you believe, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, he finds some followers, disciples just means followers, some people who believe, and they have believed in Jesus. And he asks, asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now remember that back in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, it came upon Jewish people who had received Jesus. Then in Acts chapter 10, they were really freaking out because it came upon people who were not Jews, who were Gentiles, and they began to speak in other language, languages showing that the Holy Spirit was among them too. So, if you, if you follow the, the progression, you have uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other parts of the earth. Now, now we're in the other parts of the earth because we're up on the top of the Mediterranean where Paul is ministering. And he's, he, com he comes to Ephesus in Greece and he finds some followers of Jesus. And he says, Do you receive, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? Like, what are you following then? Because uh, they hadn't, they didn't have any way of knowing what had gone on already in Jerusalem. The Bible hadn't been written yet. There wasn't, hadn't been people, you know, maybe talking about that yet. And so they said, we've been, been baptized into John's baptism, meaning they had repented of their sins. They had, they had, shown their humility and their their, their 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 wanting to follow after Christ by by being baptized okay but they had not experienced the Holy Spirit that Jesus had given after he after he'd gone to heaven so the Holy Spirit had been given but these people were at, were still at a place where they didn't uh, know about that and then so it says, then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance. So that's, that's John's baptism that we're looking at here. John, John baptized people to repent of your sins and, and, and be ready for the coming Messiah. Saying to the people that they, would be, that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So the, the message of John the Baptist was, there's one coming after me. Believe on him. Get ready now by repenting of your sins and being baptized. And so, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they were baptized this time in a different sense. They were baptized in a way that signified that they believed in Jesus. And, then, and when, when we go to Romans 6, we find out that when we get baptized as Christian believers, we part of that is identifying with Jesus' death and resurrection. So it's a different sort of baptism when we get, when, when they got John's baptism, it was really just kind of saying, I want to be clean, okay? But so when, but when they're getting baptized into Jesus' name, when Jesus had said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and we'll see at the very end of Matthew, you see that that's a different thing because it's, it's, it's trusting and it's showing a faith in Jesus, an identification with Jesus, and also an identification with his death and his resurrection. So, and then the Holy Spirit came on them after that. So, that's good. That answers, totally yeah. answers my question. <laughs> yeah, we were just kind of moving through to that, but uh, that's cool. So, verse 15. Then what happens is uh, we're in Matthew 3. So we got this understanding of baptism. And uh, verse 14, uh, 13, I'm sorry. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Now, remember, all these places have taken about a day to get to. So from Jerusalem, the, 
Pharisees, Sadducees coming up, it takes about a day. So it's a commitment to come out where John is. And Jesus came, comes from Galilee, which is on the north side of, you know, the, the north side by the uh, Sea of Galilee, which is, you know, several miles long, maybe 60 miles long. I can't remember exactly how far it is. But it's a ways. And he comes down to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus says in verse 15, and this is the only place in the, the different Gospels where it says that Jesus said this, but he says, It is fit fitting for me to get baptized for you. It's okay for me to be, get baptized by you to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, to do all the things that, are, that, that a person is supposed to do to be righteous. And, and, and part of this was Jesus was identifying with the sinners whose sins he would bear, okay? There would be sin. His righteousness was going to be given to them. So he was, he, was, he was identifying with sinners. He was identifying with people who needed their, their sins forgiven. But he was also symbolizing his death and resurrection, which is what baptism now stands for. But he says, I'm doing this to fulfill all righteousness, to do everything that's required. And so that's what uh, he allowed John to baptize him, even though he didn't have any sin. So, so John knows that he doesn't have any sin to repent of. He knows that he's, uh, uh, he's not like the other people that will have sin. He's, he's sinless. So, but, but Jesus humbly goes through this just like all sinners, just like he would humbly took our, our place on the cross. Because it's, it's something to, to identify with us and, our, and what we need to do. And so we have this part where it says that the he when he came up from the water, behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Now, I don't know that there's a lot of people have a, a picture of the, uh, the baptism of Jesus. And they'll have a little dove, okay? They'll have a little dove sitting on Jesus' head, an actual bird. But the Bible doesn't say that it's an actual bird that actually that comes there. It says it, it landed on him, some sort of form of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't really say what it would look like or anything. But it says some sort of form kind of came down on Jesus like a dove. And um, I could send you a link to a, a, a video of that if you want. But uh, it's just kind of like really... Uh, Someone filmed it? It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. the iPhone negative 6.0. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. of, the, 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 of the dove. Of a dove doing that. Just kind of to see this, the sense of it. But we won't do that right now. But maybe later after I'll, I'll send it to you. But just to kind of get the uh, sense of the, the, the spirit descended and they're, they're using a, a figure of speech or a simile. It looked like a, how a dove lands on, on something. So it just basically, the, maybe the gracefulness or the way, it, the way it says it lighted on him. So we don't know whether it looked like a dove or it didn't look like a dove, but one of the things that's important is that in another gospel it says that well, actually, let's turn there because it, this really helps. I, normally, we don't go to other, we're trying not to go to other Gospels, <laughs> but sometimes it help, helps. John chapter 1. Go to the book of John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 32. Could somebody read that? And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. Okay, verse 33. I, my, I myself did not know him, 
But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Okay, see the, see the uh, word there? He who you see the Spirit descending on and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John says, I didn't know. He says, I didn't even know. Je Jesus is John's cousin. We find that out later in another gospel. But uh, he's not clearly identified as such, I guess, to John because John says, this is when I knew this was the one who baptized with, with the Holy Spirit. And so it also says that he remained, the Holy Spirit remained on him. Now we know Jesus didn't go around with some sort of dove on his head, uh, you know, throughout his ministry. So I believe that it's just, it's just an indication that, that John saw, and that's what he says he saw. Who saw? Jesus saw? I believe he's talking about John. John saw the Holy Spirit descending on him in the form of a dove. And so he knew that that was the one that he was looking for. And also that John was told that there's, this was going to happen. Okay, John was told about this. He was told that uh, there would be one that he would baptize who would uh, the dove would remain. Uh, I'm sorry. And I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he was sent me to baptize with water. So he's saying, God sent me to baptize with water. He said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And this is how God confirmed it to John the Baptist that this is Jesus who had been prophesied. So we have a couple things that, that come out of this. and there's, there's two things. One of them is that well, obviously, the last part here is that Jesus inaugurated a new time. This is from this point on, Jesus begins to, to do all the things that we know of Jesus doing. Up to this point, he's been kind of quiet, and the Bible doesn't record very much of his life before this. But this is his ministry that the Holy Spirit has come upon him, and it's showing that this is the one we need to listen to. This is the one who will eventually give us the Holy Spirit. And so that's, that's one part of it. But the other part of it is that John calls out people who, who went along with what was popular, who went along with what was going on to look good. And he calls them out and he says, are you really worried about judgment? Do you really have fruit in your life that shows that you have repented of your sin and you want to change? Because I don't want to be baptizing you just because it's popular. I don't want to be. That's kind of what he was saying. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. And don't think to say to yourself just because you're in the position you are um, of being Jewish leaders descended from Abraham that you have some special position that God is not going to look on your, your life your person and know you and know everything about you. And I think we can, even though it, it's not exactly parallel to our situation today, I think we can see the seriousness of, of what John is trying to communicate here. Because he's saying, show fruit, show something in your life that indicates that you are really repentant of your sin. And I think, you know, we need to ask, you know, when we come to something like this, we need to ask ourselves, well, what is is there something in my life that indicates that I am really repentant of my sins? Or is it I'm just going along with how things are going, how everybody's doing it in the, in the circle that I'm in? And so that's, that's the application of this that I think is important here because when Jesus, when we come to Christ, um, the Bible says that when you the Holy Spirit was going to come. He was going to rebuke this, the world of, of sin and righteousness and judgment. He will convict the world of sin. And so if the Holy Spirit is in our life and you know we, uh, we know we're, we're coming around, we're doing the right thing, but we know there's sin in our lives, 
John maybe speaks to us in, in some way here today. And I just wanted to give us a few minutes to kind of think about that and also think about the fact of, you know, we have the Holy Spirit given, but in this context, it's also talking about the judgment of God. And that's not a small thing. That's not a thing to be complacent about or, or unwor uh, not worried about, but uh, unconcerned about. Because we need, we, we need to know that we're in that position with God where we know that things are right because we have trusted in Jesus to fulfill all the righteousness. We've been trust, in tr trusted in Jesus to be the righteousness. We've trusted in Jesus to be the one that died for our sin. And we've, and we've, and we've, and we've embraced that and, and believed that and took hold of that. Those are the two things that 